Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Perspectives on the Pandemic, a UST College of Science webcast. I am uh, Michael Barami from the UST Department of Biological Sciences, and with me is... Hello, Paul. Hi, everyone. I am Ro Bennett as well from the UST Department of Biological Sciences as well. So to start, let us, uh, of course, begin with a um, prayer. So, prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas before study. So in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, origin of all well-being, Graciously let a ray of your light penetrate the darkness of our understanding. Take from us a double darkness in which we have been born, obscurity of sin and ignorance. Give us a keen understanding, our attentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant us the talent of being exact in our explanations and the ability to express ourselves with foreignness and charm. Point out the beginning direct the progress and help in the completion we ask this through Christ, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name amen. of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, good morning, everyone. Morning, everyone. Uh, before we start, I think it would be good to remind our audience of a few guidelines for the webinar to avoid feedback. So, a few reminders uh, for people joining us. Please switch off your microphone to avoid interference. Uh, to ask a question for people on Blackboard Collaborate, kindly raise your hand, or you may type in your question in the chat box and our moderators will read it. After clicking the raise your hand button, please wait for the moderator to acknowledge you before speaking. And for our friends watching on Facebook Live, kindly type in your questions on the comments section, and we'll try to go through them uh, if we do have some time. So uh, before we start, we would like to uh, welcome the Dean of the USD College of Science, uh, Professor Dr. Ray Don Papa for his welcome remarks. So good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon from the Philippines. Um, so this is the second event uh, for our uh, Modified Enhanced Online Week of Science. Of course, earlier today, we had uh, the successful launch and the first webinar uh, of the Modified Enhanced Online Week of Science, wherein we had um, Dr. Melvin Sanikas uh, discuss you know, prospects about uh, vaccine development uh, related to the uh, COVID-19. Now, um, of course, what we have now is uh, this webcast. And um, for this uh, particular webcast, uh, we have uh, invited um, our colleagues and uh, alumni uh, to discuss no, perspective, their, their perspectives on uh, the pandemic. And uh, I'm sure it will make for a good discussion. Um, we have uh, with us uh, frontliners, no? uh, scientific frontliners in the battle against COVID-19. Of course, they have ties uh, to the university, either as alumni or as uh, faculty members of the uh, College of Science. And uh, they're all here to share their insights and um, uh, their ideas, no? And um, even our moderator, one of our moderators, um, Mike Barami, of course, is a faculty member of the department, and he's joining us from the United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, in so many ways, he is also involved. Um, he, he may also later share some experiences related <laughs> to his experience with uh, COVID-19 uh, from the United Kingdom. And so this will all make for a very interesting uh, discussion uh, this afternoon. 
Um, thank you to our participants in uh, Blackboard Collaborate as well as in Facebook Live. Um, I hope you will learn something from um, the uh, proceedings of this uh, webcast. And uh, let us all continue to support one another, support one another as we all go through uh, our lives no? um, under the conditions um, that are imposed to us by this pandemic. So with that, um, I give the floor back to our moderators. Uh, so have a fruitful afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Papa. So uh, continuing from the previous webinar uh, that we had on the search for a vaccine against the coronavirus, I think it's time to look at two more aspects of making concerted efforts to mitigate its effects. The first is understanding how the virus spreads. And the second aspect is testing people or members of a population for coronavirus. Yeah, so uh, this morning we are very fortunate to be uh, graced by the presence of four individuals that are helping the country's efforts against the pandemic. So they are all proudly Samashians, either as alumni, faculty, and or researchers at the RCNAS. So we'd like to introduce them to everyone tuning in. Is there a mic? So uh, our first uh, resource speaker is currently a professor of biology at the Providence College in Rhode Island, USA. He's also a professor of theology in the same institution, is a uh, research fellow for the Center for Religious Studies and Ethics at USD, and is the director of ThomisticEvolution.org. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, Father Nicanor Ostriaco, OP, PhD. Father, uh, can you hear me? Oh, he, oh I, I don't, I think he might. Can you hear me, Father? No? Oh, some, some audio problems on his end. Uh, our second resource speaker is a, a, uh, currently an associate professor uh, from the Department of Mathematics and Physics at USD and is a researcher uh, at the Research Center for the Natural and Applied Sciences uh, at the University of Santo Tomas. Uh, can you hear me? Dr. Bernard Egwolf. Oh, Father, yes, uh, we can hear yes, you. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, sorry. And our next speaker, <laughs> uh, second speaker is uh, Dr. Bernard Egwolf. Yeah. Hello. Bennett? Good afternoon. Hi. Okay, good afternoon. Po. So our, thir our third speaker would be uh, Dr. Benedict Maralit. So he's a graduate of BS and MS Biology from the University of Santo Tomas. At present, he is the program director of the DNA sequencing core facility of the Philippine Genome Center of the University of the Philippines in Diliman, and likewise an assistant professor of the National Institute for Molecular Biology and Biotechnology at UP Diliman as well. So we have Dr. Benedict Maralit. So I think he is somewhere or still trying. I think he's here already. Yeah. And of course, our fourth speaker, certainly not the least, would be Miss Amalea Dulcin Nicolasora. Again, she's a graduate of BS Biology and MS Biology from the University of Santo Tomas. And at present, she is a senior science research specialist. And likewise, the molecular diagnostics section head of the molecular biology lab of the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine, UH. So we have Miss Amalea Nicolasora. Ama, are you there? Um, hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And can we hear Dr. Maralit? Hello, yes, okay na ba? Hi, okay. Dr. Maralit is already <laughs> here. Thank you. Right. So we do have uh, four uh, brilliant uh, guest speakers. Uh, so let's start with the first aspect uh, of testing and diagnosis. So one of the very most, one of the most important and controversial aspects of mitigation in uh, the spread of the virus is testing. Unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there, especially in terms of what tests to use, what they tell us, and how important they are. So 
my first two questions I'd like to direct to Dr. Moral Moralit and uh, Ms. Nicola Sora. Once and for all, can you differentiate the different kinds of COVID tests? So in the press, a lot of people hear about rapid testing versus PCR, PCR testing. C can you tell us the difference in what they're used for? Oh, okay, uh, uh, yeah. I'll let um, uh, answer first. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> okay, um, um, PCR test uh, uses a set of nucleotides that targets a specific region in the RNA of the virus. So it um, detects the virus at a DNA or RNA level. And then for the rapid test kit, um, it can either detect the viral proteins or antigen expressed by the pathogen or the virus and or the antibody expressed by the host when there is an infection. So um, I think the collection time for this test um, are different because um, the virus is detectable um, at zero to seven days um, for PCR or longer. And then for um, the rapid test kit, sometimes um, uh, the detection can only be, uh, um, the virus can only be detected at um, around four to seven days or later um, the, um, during the infection. So I hope I <laughs> um, explained it. <laughs> um, I hope you understand my explanation. Yeah. Father, you were raising your hands, Father. Uh, can you can you hear right. us? I can finally hear you now. Can you hear me? That's great. Yes, Father. Loud and clear. I had to log out of my computer and into onto my iPad. So <laughs> okay. Good. Good to know, Father. Thank you. So I I have not heard anything for the past ten minutes. Just oh. so you know. So I apologize for that. Uh, I'll just listen and catch up. Y yes, Father. Thank you, Father. Uh, Dr. Malalit, you uh, you uh, had uh, something to say? Uh, just to um, to reiterate some of the things that Ama said, no. Um, I think um, we're all really in agreement with regards to PCR testing being the you know the uh, gold standard for detecting COVID nineteen, right? For rapid test kits, I think we have several different ideas with regards to those, mainly because um, there are two types of rapid testing um, kits available. For example, that one would be yung mm -hmm. antigen testing mm -hmm. and another one would be antibody rapid testing, no? Mm -hmm. so, um, oh. Nawala ata. Yeah, we, we can hear you, Dr. Moralit. Uh, we just can't see your video, but we were able to hear you. Okay, so yun. Um, the important thing to note na lang, I think, is yung um, um, rapid testing is really fast, no? But of course, um, yung available data suggesting by WHO, I guess, is that it's not really um, for for clinical um, diagnosis of COVID-19 infections. Yes, but it's really important to note also that this can really help in epidemiological studies ganyan, for research. But for, you know, um, for medical and clinical decisions, I think it's important to note that rapid test kits right now, at, at least the data tells us na it might not be that helpful. So, yeah. so, so uh, just to clarify, so for our guests uh, on Facebook who may not have a science background, uh, a, a PCR test tells a uh, scientist or whoever that a person currently has an infection, while a rapid test tells if that person has been exposed to the virus. Is this uh, correct? Mm, yes, that's right. Um, okay. Yeah. So at, at the start, at the start, uh, in terms of rapid testing, there seemed to be an issue in terms of test kits because, especially for rapid testing, uh, there only seemed to be a proportion that was able to be uh, detected by these rapid test kits. Um, and in and, and, and the press, there seems to be uh, an aspect regarding sensitivity and specificities of a test. Uh, 
Father, do you want to weigh in on this uh, regarding specificity well, and sensitivity of tests? So I arrived in the United States two days ago, and I'm actually in quarantine now in Rhode Island. And then tomorrow mm-hmm. I will go get my test. So uh, everyone who enters the state of Rhode Island must get a test. And so I will go get my test tomorrow. And they're telling me it's going to take two to three days because I'm assuming it's an RT-PCR. It's a nasopharyngeal swab, so I'm going to stick it up my nose, I'll <laughs> twirl it around for a few seconds yeah. and identify the RNA. So uh, one of the things I think is one early on, especially different companies had kits that had different uh, rates of, of perfection. We can put it that way. And so, you, you know, you are, you are worried that some kits will tell you that you have virus when you do not. That's a false positive. And most people are also, the, the opposite is even worse, where you, the, 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 the kit will tell you you do not have it, but you do. And so, uh, especially for rapid tests, from what I understand, and so here in my state of Rhode Island, there are two. You can get the rapid test if you are sick now. Uh, I am not, I don't, I have no symptoms. So they're going to send me to the RT-PCR for a few days. Mm -hmm. And I understand with these rapid kits, um, if you have it, the rapid kit can tell you you have it. If you don't have it, it takes longer for the rapid test to tell you you don't have it. And the rate of error is greater then. So I, I, I really think that Comparing March to now, the kits are that are better tested. We mm-hmm. have more experience of them. We know when to use them and to deploy them. So tomorrow is my first. I, I've not had a, a, a COVID test ever. So tomorrow is my first one. So I let you know it's one of those things. I'm actually excited to figure out how they do it mm-hmm. since I've been thinking and writing about these tests and I've not experienced it myself. Well, I hope, I mean, first off, we're glad that you feel okay, Father, uh, yeah. and hopefully it turns out negative. Uh, yes. Well, actually, I, I, have, I have a suspicion I actually had it already. So, mm-hmm. so you, you're like telling you're asymptomatic. That I had it in March because one of my students was very sick. March. He was just diagnosed. Um, he just had an antibody test done this weekend, and mm-hmm. they they figured, they realized that he has been positive for COVID for several months. He lost his smell in February and he has only recovered half of it back. And we were working together in the lab very closely at that time. Oh, wow. And then when I went to the Philippines over in March, I felt terrible, but I thought mm-hmm. it was just jet lag. <laughs> and I have a feeling that I went through COVID already, but and here is the danger, right? So the RT-PCR will pick up fragments of virus, the virus even if the yes. virus is dead. It's not dead so yes. my concern is that if I test positive, it is not clear if the positivity will be before for virus I have now mm-hmm. or remnants of virus from a long time ago. This is from Korea where they showed that a parent retesting, repositive testing is not that you get sick again, but you have residual virus because the RT-PCR test is so sensitive. Thank you, Father. Okay, so I just like to ask something specifically to Miss Ama since Nagu work she's working on. I mean, she's working at um, RITM. So oftentimes, of course, we know that the press criticizes, you know, you you H. So for, regarding I mean, the slow processing and release of test results from both RITM and DOH. So could you please give us an idea of the journey of a nasal swab takes from hospital to test results? So parang ano ba yung process talaga? So that we have a generalized idea since you're working at RITM. Okay, so um, lab testing for the sample, uh, um, it has three phases. So we have the pre-analytical phase, the analytical phase, and then the post-analytical phase. So PCR testing is just a portion of the uh, laboratory testing workflow. So upon sample collection, 
um, the, the clinical lab um, will prepare the relevant forms for testing. And then um, together with the sample, the sample is um, transported to the reference lab if the hospital does not have the um, testing lab for COVID-19. And then um, we should also take note that um, when you are transporting samples um, containing infectious uh, pathogen, um, there are certain packaging standards that needs to be followed. And so um, it takes a while before this sample is um, transported to the reference lab. And then once we receive the specimen, the laboratory assigned for the reception and opening of these boxes will check first the sample acceptability. So they will check if the documents and request forms are complete, check if there is a leakage, and then check if the required temperature for transport is being followed and then um, check if the sample volume um, is enough for testing. And also they will cross check the label and um, the information in the documents um, with the sample label. So um, they will assign the sample ID for that sample they received and the information is encoded in the database. Then um, this is the pre-analytical phase of um, lab testing. And then um, after the sample was accepted, uh, is accepted, um, it will um, uh, proceed to analytical testing. So um, first the accepted sample will go to the lab, which will inactivate this sample prior to PCR testing. So um, inactivation means um, this lab is assigned to um, make the sample or treat the sample to become less infectious, infectious once it arrives to the PCR testing lab. So after inactivation, um, the sample will be, will be received by the lab assigned for PCR testing. And then um, nucleic acid extraction is performed first before um, really testing it in the PCR assay. So um, the DNA, uh, the RNA extracted will be the one used for PCR testing. And then after the PCR run, it will be analyzed, the results, and interpreted. And then after analysis, it will be verified first by the supervisor if it's correct or if the run is valid. And all the QC um, quality controls are there in the test, uh, in the samples that uh, are tested and then um, after being verified, um, it will be, the results will be encoded and then um, the department head will um, approve or review the results before it is um, released to the office assigned uh, to print or forward the result to DOH or the disease reporting unit. So I would like to emphasize that testing. A sample does not mean that once we receive the sample, it will be immediately loaded to the PCR machine. So um, testing is not a one, two, three step. There are quality control checkpoints that we need to do. And also we need to follow biosafety practices to avoid um, laboratory acquired infection. infection. So to um, for us also to be safe from the virus or from the sample. So um and then, as I've said, PCR testing is only a portion of it. And there are still other steps. And we make sure that all the samples we test um, have the same QC checks, whether it's one or thousands of samples that we test. And, um, uh, and at the start of this outbreak, um, so, <laughs> at the start of this outbreak, um, our lab is the only one testing. Uh -huh. um, all the samples coming from um, the hospitals from the Philippines. Um, we, it's our lab. Uh, the, our lab was the one testing it, and um, we only have less than thirty people, <laughs> twenty four uh, working twenty four seven. And then, um, honestly, the lab, our lab, does not have the capacity capacity to process thousands of samples daily. And 
increase in the number of samples means that the established turnaround time, which is 48 hours, will be extended. Because the 48 hours PAT is only for 100 to 300 samples. So if you have 1,000, maybe um, your PAT will also be extended. So your 48 hours will be doubled or tripled. And then testing is also a rate limiting step. So the capacity is not dictated by the number of PCR machines you have. You have so um, you, uh, your limiting factors are your the manpower, bio safety cabinets for extraction. So um, even if you have a lot of test kit, a lot of PCR machine, if you have you're lacking with manpower, so you cannot really maximize the um, maximum num number of number of tests that will be performed your by your PCR machine or your you cannot use 100,000 reactions um, with your test kit if you lack manpower because um, uh, yun, kailangan talaga yun. And then um, even if you resort to automation, um, the results uh, that is generated is not verified or validated by robots. There are still people that needs to approve and um review the results. So I hope I was able to explain our part um, for this uh, test. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Nicolosar. So one aspect is testing. Another aspect also of understanding and mitigating uh, the spread is trying to predict how the virus will spread. So recently, Dr. Eggwolf and father of Triaco developed the UST Cove 2 model uh, to determine how the virus spreads. Uh, Dr. Eggwolf, could you mind telling us briefly how the model works and what it tells us? So the model is basically uh, based on machine learning. Mm -hmm. So basically you take the existing data of the number of cases and the number of deaths and then you take the model as a mathematical model. It's mm -hmm. basically a system of differential equations. And then you solve it and at the same time optimize it to fit the data, to get the best fit of the model with the data. And then the model will also uh, predict for the future. It basically uh, tries to match as good as possible the existing data. And then mm -hmm. it also can extend into the future to make predictions right and and you know clearly uh, a, a model can merely predict to a certain uh, range of accuracy so how accurate how, how accurate do you think this model is and what do you think are its strengths and, and limitations so um yeah the, the accuracy depends greatly on the input data okay so we get our Input data basically from the Department of Health. It's, okay. they, they basically publish their data. There are websites where you can see it. Mm -hmm. There's also a drop box where you can download uh, Excel files with the data. And um, yeah, the data has some problems. You've just seen it uh, right. a few weeks ago. There was some backlog, so they, they had mm -hmm. a lot of tests done, but many of them were not included in their mm -hmm. reporting. Then they, they did late reporting. This caused some uh, effects in the, in the data. So um, it's, a, yeah, it, it's not perfect, but uh, we have to live with that. We have to um, use that data. There's also, of course, uh, a lot of people uh, might not be included or might not be mm -hmm. tested and they are still positive. So there might be some kind of a, a, a number of people who are not included in the statistics, but our model is actually uh, has a compartment which uh, also includes mm -hmm. uh, positive cases which are not reported. So okay. our model is actually quite sophisticated. It can take care of that. Thank you, Dr. Eggwolf. Father, do you uh, care to chime in? Well, so 
you know, Manila, the NCR is undergoing a surge now. So uh, if you look at the last week, the data in the last week, it is very clear that the number of cases in the NCR is rising rapidly. And so we are looking, in fact, after I speak, finish speaking with you, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Eggwolf and we'll be looking at some data. I sent him some data earlier today. Uh, it looks like the positivity rate and the hospitalization rate in the NCR is dramatically increasing over the last few days. Now, when we are, I'm going to try to run our model today. The difficulty mm -hmm. in running our model, especially with the data that we have, is that the DOH predicts that the data for the last week is not complete. And we know from there, you know, this is a, this is a time of pandemic. So there's going to be log jams of data and the validation of data. And I, we understand that completely. However, one of the, when you do not have complete data, it is difficult for the model to predict, predict to make forecasts that are as accurate as they could be if you had all the data that we have. So for example, mm -hmm. when I run the model today, I will, I will stop the data from about five days ago. So the mm -hmm. last five days, if you look at the data, it appears that the number of cases has dropped dramatically, but we know that it has not dropped dramatically. The drop is actually simply the lack of data and the delay and lag of data reporting. So we will just ignore the last five days and then run the model to see. Now, that, the last five days is quite uh, impactful, especially if you're in the middle of a surge. So if you're in the middle of a surge, it's very important to know how steep the curve is and how fast the number of cases are, are increasing. So if you have a five day lag, the model can only tell us what, what would have happened five days ago and not today. So that's really part, uh, you know, and we're, we're trying to get data, but, but um, as Amalia, as, as, as Amalia was saying, um, there's just inherent delays, especially when you have significant numbers of tests. And right now there's, there's a surge in Cebu, there's a surge in Manila. So I imagine that the tests are being overwhelmed now. So my sense is that the number of tests is increasing both here and in region seven in order to try to keep up with those, with those, with the number of cases. Uh, so father. Yes. Uh, so father, I'd just like to ask, so does your model, for example, take into consideration the mutation that's occurring within the uh, genome of the virus or just purely based on the data provided by DOH? So, so the model is dependent upon actually not the virus itself. So the model can be used to model any pandemic, uh -huh. bacterial, viral. So it's not dependent upon the actual pathogen itself, uh -huh. but the rate of spread. So if the virus mutates, so its rate of spread will increase, then the model will take that into account because the rate of spread will change. And so the model will see that rate of change and then compensate for its forecasting. So we do not incorporate in a math mathematical model the biology of the pathogen, the but you can model the, 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 the biology if the biology affects the behavior. And so mm -hmm. we, we are modeling the behavior of the pathogen as it spreads through the population. So you saw, there's this paper from Cell that was published in the last couple of days that is talking about the increased transmissibility of a mutation in the spike protein of uh, COVID-2. COVID One of the things that's not clear is which virus is infecting the Philippines. Mm. So you have two versions the D and the G. So now we're not quite sure. I, and this is something we should talk about with regards to the genome center in the Philippines. Have any of the viruses in the Philippines been sequenced so we can identify 
the variant of the virus that is actually spreading here in our country? I do not know that. That would be a wonderful question to ask uh, the Filipino Genome Center. Uh, okay. Doc, Dr. Moralit, uh, yeah, maybe probably. he might want to comment, <laughs> yeah, if, if he's still online. Yes, uh, Dr. Answer. Morales, I'm sorry, I did not know if you were online, but do you know, <laughs> have any of the genomes been sequenced for COVID-2 isolated from patients in the Philippines? Uh, yes, sir. Um, regarding your question about the, um, what do you call that, COVID-19 um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 genomes have already been sequenced. Yes, there are. So at the Philippine Genome Center, we actually sequenced more than around 100, but we only got complete genome sequences of around six, mainly because six. Uh, mainly because we weren't able to optimize our sequencing um, um, experiments during that time. But um, how deep is your sequencing? Um, how many bases do you? Uh, how many times do you sequence each base? Our coverage for that sequencing is around 30x, but um, that's a, a bit low, actually, because we actually were planning to do um, shotgun metagenomics at the start because we also wanted to sequence um, what do you call that? Young passenger viruses also in our test. No. Um, at the same time, also get whole genomes. And as a result, we only got six out of 100. Um, but we're going to do a follow-up study. Po. Um, so we're now going into amplicon sequencing. So we're enriching our case, our samples with, um, we're doing a PCR enrichment basically to just get more of the virus and then complete the genomes. And then we'll see um, the different variants that may be, um, 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 what they call that, widespread in the Philippines. But based on our initial data, yung six po, um, we see a similarity with regards to um, the variants um, that's spreading in other countries as well. But that's a very small number that's only six po, no? So I think we're hoping- So on. in your six, did you, did you see in your six that you have the D version or the G version in the spike region, the one that, was, that is being discussed um, in the press? So, in the last week, there are several reports of highly inf uh, a more infectious variant that is now prevalent in the United States. So if you compare the original population in China and Wuhan versus in the United States, from what I understand, there is a infectious variant that, is, that has a selective advantage and is growing uh, throughout the United States and is overtaking the original variant from Wuhan. And I'm just wondering, in the Philippines, with the six, has anyone looked to see if it's the the, the, the original variant or the infection, the the more infectious variant? Um, right now, Paul, we haven't really looked into it. Um, in in our initial analysis, Paul, we really found new variants that may be unique to the Philippines. But looking more into it, it was just a sequencing error. So I think we're we're really um, we're we're having a plan to do a a more in-depth study. So it's. I already um, submitted a proposal for that to the OST. So basically, once we get the go signal, we'll be doing a lot and getting more information about you know these possible variants in the Philippines. Are the six complete genomes available for the to the public? Yeah. Yes. Sure. So can I email you and ask you to send me the six? <laughs> Actually, sir, it's um a publicly available at GISAID, if you're familiar okay, with, GISAID, yes. with that um database. So it's already been it's already been submitted. So then yeah. I can just look it up the the six Philippine genomes and then because I just want to look the single amino acid. I want to know if the single amino acid in the spike region is present in any of the six. I think so. You will be able to look at the sequence. Let me double check. If you don't have access, then you can email us. Paul. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Paul. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was like trying to look into the uh, the genomes of the viruses for the past couple of months. So I'm actually also waiting for the sequences from PGC. So yeah. So I think it's it's a good uh, thing that. Everything is already publicly available. But I have a question to uh, Dr. Eggwolf. 
sir. So what are the recommendations based from the model that you that you generated or from the data that you were able to generate together with father. So what are your recommendations to the interagency task force of COVID if given, for instance, the chance? So first, um, um, the, the main uh, suggestion is to uh, uh, have enough people to track the virus. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, also to have enough uh, capacity for testing and uh, um, this should be really available for those who are tracking the people. So basically, whenever somebody was tested, they have to interview that person, ask what are the contacts in the previous days, and then try to track them down and then uh, try to test all of them. And then... If somebody is positive, of course, uh, they have to undergo quarantine. So now we uh, are in a situation where we have uh, partially lifted our quarantine. Uh, so it's sort of the, the modified enhanced quarantine. And now there are more people out there. So these uh, mitigation measures are now more and more important. Okay, so when the people are out there, uh, it's more important to uh, track people more quickly uh, because uh, if, the, if there's more mobility, then there's also a chance that uh, this, the virus can spread faster. So uh, tracking is one of the most important things now. And um, yeah, we have to observe. So as uh, Father, Nikanor said there's a, 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 a rise now in the number of cases. I, also, my wife told me that the hospitals are preparing more beds now. Some are opening new wards because of the increasing number of cases. They see now this kind of an early warning uh, signal. You can see if you know some doctors in hospitals, uh, they can tell you that they are they are preparing now for more. And uh, we have to be careful. So it looks like there's a new search going on and uh, we have to try to um, flatten that. Otherwise, uh, it will go up very quickly. Uh, Dr. Egwolf, a follow-up question, and maybe uh, Father can chime in as well. Yeah. So there's a question from the chat. It's from uh, your, your colleague in the math department, uh, Mr. Daniel Vicario. Are, are there specific factors that are present only in the Philippines, which is why we have the highest uh, transmission rate or the R uh, sub zero uh, death rate and recovery rates in Asia as compared to our neighbors? So are there, are there specific factors that can be attributed to the Philippines and not in other countries? Okay, so let me respond. So first of all, the recovery rate. The recovery rate in the Philippines is, is actually an artifact of the government-imposed definition for what constitutes a recovery, right? So, okay. so, so one, of the re one of the things if you notice, if you go on the Johns Hopkins website, it looks like no one is getting cured in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. It looks like people in the Philippines are getting sick and they're sick for two months, three months. Now, the reason for this is actually early on, the government decided that to define someone as recovered, you have to pass a certain number of PCR tests. And so right. two, actually two. So from what I understand, people don't go back for that second test. So if you do not go back for that second test, then you have recovered clinically, but you technically have not recovered officially. And so you can see in the numbers, this is why when Dr. Egwolf and I modeled the pandemic, we ignored the recovery rates completely in the Philippines because if mm -hmm. we included it into our data, um, the model doesn't make any sense because people are not getting well um, in the way that they should based upon the biology of the virus. And if you remember, um, the DOH just published new criteria for recovery about 10 days ago. 
where now they're, they're just simply counting the number of days after symptoms begin, which is what uh, a lot of countries around the world are doing. So I, I would like to point out that the recovery rate is nothing to do with the biology. With regards to, to, the, to the actual pandemic, one of the things we are learning around the world is the challenge of controlling the pandemic is inherently dependent upon how many cases you had when you shut down the first time. So countries that shut down early, like Thailand. So Thailand has a direct flight from Wuhan. So they shut down very quickly. In fact, they did one of the first sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 genome, was done in Bangkok outside of China. So their viral load at the beginning of the pandemic was much smaller. So it was easier to contain. Now, I was not yet in the Philippines in February, and I understand that there were political reasons why the Filipino government did not close the borders to Chinese travelers until later. And so what happens is that means the original pool of virus that you have is actually greater. And there are estimates that every day you delay the lockdown is a week longer at the other side that you have to worry about getting the numbers down. And so any delay at the beginning, any delay in March would have caused issues that we're having today. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing, of course, is that um, we have highly concentrated cities in the national capital region. And you have areas where social distancing is not practical because of the poverty of the people. And so it is a particular struggle when you are using quarantine to, to regulate a, a, a pandemic when the people are incapable of quarantining appropriately because of poverty. And that's what you're seeing today. Um, and so we, and uh, the strategy that the, that, that the government is, is using, which is targeted lockdowns is the way to go. Um, but they have to do a lot more contact tracing in the barangays that are locked down. And this is, this is the struggle. You lock down a barangay, but you have to go into the barangay and identify everyone in the barangay who's positive and isolate them. And I think one of the weak points is that we are not properly able to do that. The second issue that we've had in the last few weeks is we had OFWs and uh, returning overseas Filipinos. From what I understand, they were allowed to return to some of their provinces and they were, de they were not tested properly. So they, they arrived in their home provinces with the virus, which is why there are now provinces in several islands in the Visayas that only got their first case in the last few weeks. This also has to stop. Otherwise it'd be very difficult to control the leakage of the virus throughout our country. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Uh, so, Father, so, you were like mentioning that this one is basically attributed to controlling the population, right? I mean, those that are potentially infected. So, so um, remember, if everyone in the Philippines was frozen down for three weeks, the pandemic will be over. Because what will happen is that in three weeks, the virus would be cleared out of everyone who has it for the most part, and it would not be able to spread. So one of the, 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 the challenge that the government and the people have is to balance mobility. So you need to, be, you need to have mobility in order to have an economy. But the more mobility you have, the more viral spread you are inviting in your community. So there's this balance that you need to have. And the way it's being done around the world, which, was, which the Philippines has been doing for the past month, is this target, targeted lockdowns. It is better to, 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 to lock down eight barangays in Quezon City rather than the whole NCR. Right. It's, as long as you can identify 
the hot spots of the barangays that need to be quarantined. And you have to make sure that no one is going in and out. And the, and the leakage of the people is, is a struggle, especially when people are poor, because they have to go and they have to eat. They have to find money to feed themselves and their children. And so we have to be very sensitive to that challenge. Okay, so thank you, Father. I'd just like to um, give a follow-up question to Dr. Maralit and probably Ms. Ama can also answer later on. So, uh, Dr. Maralit, so what was the problem with the locally developed PCR kits? And was it validated against the uh, standard kits and likewise with sequencing results? Okay, um... With regards to the locally developed kit, um, how do I say this? Um, I'm not very familiar with the details actually, um, based only on what we are hearing because actually um, the, the locally developed kit is now being handled by a spin-off company, right? It's called the yeah. Manila Health, right? So um, initially there was a ver version one, no? So it was... Um, regulated and it was approved by the local FDA, the Philippine government FDA, and then it went through testing by RATM. And then I'm sure you have heard about the news that there's now a version two, right, which has recently been um, approved again or certified by FDA um, for, for use. No, um, it's mainly because meron daw contamination. So now there's a version two and it's already um, cleared and approved by FDA. And I think it's going through... Um, what you call that um, um, distribution to to um, LGUs and different um, testing centers um, for doing their own um, testing um, testing services. Um, I think um, what's important to note really is um, right now. I think um, um, continuing COVID testing um, is a bit harder because. There is there are limitations in stocks and also um, most of our testing kits are from outside, no. And because of the lockdown and the 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 pandemic, essentially is um, hindering some travel. So there is some um, definitely we're experiencing um, um, delays in delivery. So I I guess it's important also to note na having these locally developed test kits here, right here in the Philippines, being manufactured in the Philippines, will give us a, you know, a ready, steady supply of COVID testing kits. So, yun. Thank you, Dr. Muradit. I hope that answers your question sufficiently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, Bennett, we can't seem to hear you. Are you trying to Ayun. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Maralit, but you're using a foreign kit, a kit that was bought from abroad, not the ones that we have here. Ah, for the COVID testing lab of the Philippine Genome Center, ah. what we're actually using are those that are provided um, for us by um, the DOH. So we received a lot of testing kits initially when we got our accreditation or in the, for independent COVID testing so first we were using Sunsure and then later on we were using the version one of the local COVID test kit and then later on we moved into another testing kit. So it's really dependent on, on the stocks that DOH are providing for us. Okay, so thank you. Um, probably... I'll just ask for some general questions or we'll be asking some general questions then later on because we can entertain questions from the uh, viewers as well. So this sure. one is going to be a topic regarding masks. So once and for all, do they actually work? Because there's so much misinformation that's circulating within the social media, right? So can you give some thoughts about this one? So which one, for instance, is way more effective? The face covers, surgical masks, the N95, stuff like that. So what do you suggest? Or ano po bing dapat gamitin talaga ng public? So I can take that question. Um, yes, Father. You have to understand what is the mask for? Yeah. So a lot of people think that the mask is supposed to prevent the virus 
from traveling in the air. The virus cannot fly. So the virus travels in droplets of water. So the reason why you have a mask is because when we, when we are talking, we are expelling water droplets out of our mouth. So when the mask is covering you, then you are being prevented from expelling these water droplets. So any face covering that prevents water droplets from leaving your mouth will prevent you from infecting other people. Now the debate is what kind of mask will protect you from other people who have virus? And this is a different question, right? So, so face coverings will prevent viral transmission because people who are infected will not be able to expel water droplets from their mouth as often as they would. The other question, which mask will prevent you from getting sick if someone is expelling water droplets? This is actually debated. So this is why in the United States, there's a lot of controversy uh, because they say, the data does not show that a mask will protect me from COVID. And there's, 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 there's different data sets. But I point out, it is not about the mask protecting you from others. The reason why we wear masks primarily is to protect others from us, right? So that's why any covering, which is why when you cough, you know, we cough in the shoulder, because we do not want to expel water droplets that will carry the virus everywhere. Now, you may have heard there is a controversy today. In this past week, there is a letter that has been sent to the WHO about whether or not COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 can be aerosolized. An aerosol is a very, very, very small water droplet. And the difference is that if it can be an aerosolized virus, it can linger in the air. So, and this becomes more of a difficulty for controlling spread. Again, though, if you have a face covering, the hope is that the covering will prevent you from aerosol, well, from dispersing virus everywhere. So what I tell my students and what I tell people here is, the data that viruses prevent, uh, that mass prevent droplets from being dispersed is very good. The data that, that shows that you will be protected from other people, that's, that's controversial. So, but we wear masks, but having said that, we should wear masks to protect, to, to prevent viruses from spreading. Mm. All right. Sir Mike? A anyone else? Okay. So, uh, I will now put on my science communication hat. So uh, I'm currently not in the Philippines, but I still keep up with the news and uh, news in the Philippines. And I know for a fact that Dr. Morales, Dr. Eggwolf, and Father have all made media appearances uh, explaining their expertise regarding the virus, different aspects of the virus. Now, clearly there seems to be a divide between experts like you who have scientific training and the general public who may not have uh, scientific training in terms of understanding the virus. Uh, and, and this is a question for everyone on the panel. How do you think we can bridge the gap between understanding the virus among experts and laypersons? And how do you think the press should have communicated the pandemic better to laypersons? Anyone? Uh, Dr. Morales, do you want to try first? Yes, yes. I did see Dr. Morales' uh, interview uh, on YouTube. So, Dr. Morales, uh, how do you think? Um, the, uh, yeah. I think, um, what? at least for me as a... Um, as an educator, I think it should really start from um, getting the interest of the public, no? Um, because I think, um, I don't know, I think um, less people um, get a little bit um, 
um, uninterested, disinterested with science stuff. No, I don't know. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is um, um, start early, I guess, parang ganon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, early in the education, no, no, make people curious about stuff and then, you know, um, it's follows, I guess. <laughs> well, uh, for me, the challenge actually is that a lot of people imagine the virus in wrong ways. Mm-hmm. Okay. So a lot of the education now is trying to correct the perceptions that people have about how the virus works. So, for example, a lot of people don't realize that the virus is COVID-2 is primarily a respiratory virus. So I, my mother is scared to touch people. She thinks that just by touching people, you will get sick. So, which other diseases, if you touch someone, you can get sick. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people have misconceptions about what the virus is and how the virus uh, is spread. Part of the challenge, of course, is that at the very beginning of the pandemic, we knew so little of the virus. So you Mm -hmm. are talk. You have scientists who are speaking about something that they are learning about in real time. So they are not able. They make mistakes, and I think uh, lay people do are not do not appreciate that scientists make mistakes because we are figuring out how to mm-hmm. understand something. So the whole mask issue. So early on, the WHO said masks are not necessary. So this in Asia, people use have been using masks for a lot of a lot of times. But in the United States, even now, so on the plane coming here from Manila, people who refuse to wear the mask. And, they, you, and when you talk to them, they will say, Well, I'm I'm American, I'm free. They will say I'm free to use the mask. But part of the challenge too is they hear different people saying apparently conflicting things. And so then, then they selectively hear, listen to only one thing and not the other. So, you know, with science communication, I think at the end of the day, it should be drawing pictures. Uh, it's hard to describe. We have to find creative ways of displaying what we want to say in a picture. We must show the picture all the time so that people can see the picture and understand that. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes. So uh, I think pictures are very important here to explain it to the people. Um, people. Uh, people at the very beginning, uh, COVID was discussed in relation to um, the flu. So if you look at the flu, people uh, think, yeah, that it's just a, like a cold. But uh, this was kind of misleading. When you look at what happened in Italy, in Italy, uh, there was a big surge very early because people were not so worried about what, uh, the uh, pandemic. And uh, when uh, the media started showing what's going on in the hospitals, when they showed the people in the hospital how they are dying, then the people in Italy saw how, how, um, yeah, how important it is to really follow all the quarantine restrictions implemented by the government. And then within a quite short time, they had a very effective um, flattening of the curve. So they started very bad and then improved when the people realized how dangerous it is and how many people died. So showing the people uh, what's going on in the hospital, showing the the, the pictures, the the uh, movies about uh, how doctors are struggling to save the lives of the people. That's important. So that's how the people can learn how serious this disease is. And then also, hopefully, 
uh, make a decision for themselves to protect them and others and to follow the rules of uh, the pandemic, the rules of the government, which tries to protect all of us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Egwo. So it, it, it's very interesting what you all mentioned about communicating the gravity of the pandemic to the public. Uh, so I'm trying to compare, for example, how uh, the Philippines and the UK, ex com contrasting and comparing how the Philippines and the UK expresses the gravity of the pandemic. So in the Philippines, we have terms such as ECQ, GCQ, MECQ, which, you know, I personally found confusing. Um, in, in, in the UK, they do it differently. They have a numerical scale with five being the worst case scenario and then one being uh, the, the you know very minimal case. And so uh, it, it made me just reflect that a numerical scale is actually easier to understand than, than um, lots of acronyms. Because a numerical scale is pretty logical. We use a numerical scale to describe how strong, say, storms are that hit the Philippines. And so maybe a numerical scale would have worked in explaining uh, how dangerous the pandemic was at a certain time in a certain area. Just, just well, my thoughts. Can, can I, can I, I, well, I agree with you completely. When I was in the Philippines, when the ECQ was imposed in the middle of March, and I remember one of the reasons why it was called a, a Q was because when they asked the president if this was a lockdown, he said, it's not a lockdown, it's a quarantine. Mm -hmm. And so once he, once he said that, then what they did is they built off that narrative, right? So they said, okay, it's not a lockdown, it's a quarantine. So now we have to figure out how do we convey to the public that the quarantine is changing, but it's still a quarantine. So that's when they, it was only supposed to be ECQ and DCQ. And then they had yeah. in between. And then, and then right. it got so complicated because they, uh -huh. they realized that they had to have intermediate stages. And because mm -hmm. it was not numerical, you had to add another <laughs> letter to distinguish the different stages. So at the beginning, it was supposed to be ECQ, GCQ, and the new normal. Now we have, ECQ, MECQ, GCQ, MGCQ. We have no one, you know, Manila has not even gone through MGCQ. I don't know what is after the, Q, the MGCQ, yeah. the new normal. I don't know what that is. I think we'll be in quarantine the whole time and we will be going <laughs> up and down the letter scale. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think, uh, honestly, when that happened, when I remember, I remember that he, when he was so adamant, this is not a lockdown because he did not want it to be associated with martial law. Mm -hmm. And I think the politics of the Philippines shaped the way we use the language because mm -hmm. people are so sensitive to lockdown and military intervention that they stuck with quarantine. And then once they stuck with quarantine, they had to find ways to identify the different stages of the quarantine which got very confusing. My mother to this day doesn't know where we are. <laughs> what stage? Yeah. Good perspective. Uh, so I'd like to ask uh, a few more questions, uh, specifically to father, uh, but in a different aspect. So I guess you have to put on your bioethics hat for this. Uh, they're yeah. currently developing a vaccine, uh, Oxford, King's College, some research groups in, in uh, the U.S., um, and if a vaccine is developed in about a year and a half, that would have been the fastest developed vaccine in the history of man. Uh, well, I will, I will I'll, I'll yeah. stop you there. Yes. Given the data from Pfizer that was released on Wednesday, the United States is expecting the first vaccine to be approved by September. September of this, this year. year. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's so quick. If you look at the data, if you look at the data that was published at Med Archive this past Wednesday, there, there was mm -hmm. a sample size of 45 people, but the dose response curve was fantastic. So I, in mm -hmm. the last two days, I've been talking to a lot of biotech pharma people because right now the question that we're looking at is, and this is what I'm working with, this is one of the projects at USD is how do you distribute 5 million doses of vaccine 
to the yeah. Filipino people of 110 million people. So Dr. Ed right. Wolf and I are modifying our model to incorporate a vaccine compartment because what we want to model is the following, right? There's two different parameters we have to look at. One is geography. So does every province in the Philippines get equal amount? Probably not. So what we, what we imagine is the hot spot. So Region 7, Calabarzon, NCR will probably get mm -hmm. more, right, than Samar. So, so you have to model mathematically, so it's guided by science. If you decide which geography uh, you're going to focus in on with regards to distributing the vaccine. The next question is who gets the vaccine in the NCR? Right. Now, mm -hmm. in the United States, the very first people are the military. So in the United States, in the way that the, 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 the CDC and the FDA determine the priority of a vaccine, the very first people are the military and the frontliners. So all the doctors, the nurses, they will get the vaccine first. But the question that comes is, do the old people get the vaccine before the young people? Now you will think, of course, because they are at risk. But we also know biologically that the elderly struggle to, to build a response to vaccine. So one of the things that Dr. Eggwolf and I are working on with our model is we will also have to incorporate high risk and low risk people, but with different rates of, of immunity buildup. And then you can run the model with 5 million doses. You can run the model as many times and you ask what combination of geography and population will protect the most number of people in the shortest period of time? So this is a mathematical model that is also tied with ethics. And as a bioethicist, mm -hmm. you know, I have to tell people, we must never forget the poor. Because the, 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 the challenge that we have is the rich will buy the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And we have to make sure that all of us, because we are all made in the image and likeness of God, we all must have equal access to the, va to the vaccine, but an optimized equal access to benefit the most number of people with the right. least, least number of vaccine. Does that make sense? It's right. trying mm -hmm. to, it to, to, to develop. And so one of the things uh, we are working on is to develop, because I have asked the DOH does not have a formal uh, policy for vaccine disallocation. I have asked uh, people I know in the government and they're not thinking about that yet. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I hope that we can do at UST is to combine the science with the ethics, which is something that UST yeah. is very good at, to bring it together, to develop a, um, a, a a hierarchy of distribution. So the UK has one. I don't know if you've seen it. I was looking at it the other day. No, I haven't. The, no. U the UK has one. The US has one. The Philippines does not have one. So we have to figure out how to do that. So in the UK, for example, they prioritize prisoners in prisons because they are so closely, they live with each other in such close quarters. You know, that's really important, but I don't know if and I think we have to emphasize that. And I worry that the Filipino government will not prioritize them mm -hmm. because in their mind, incarcerated men and women are at the bottom, uh, right. at the bottom of the, of, the, of the totem pole of people. And yet they are at risk because they are, they, the population density is so high that one person getting sick in a prison can lead to an outbreak that will affect the rest of the community around the prison. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you, Father. Uh, we have a, a specific question from, uh, uh, from a call from our Department of Biological Sciences, uh, Mr. Paner, uh, for Ma'am Amalea. Um, she, he wants to know, what is the real reason of the continuing cases in the Philippines? Have you solved the lack of manpower in or, or at, the, at the RITM? Um, 
could yeah uh amalia could you uh can you hear us have you solved the problem um, yes, in terms of manpower So um, for the lack of manpower, um, uh, the institute already uh, uh, solved this problem. And also, uh, as we all know, that there are already other molecular labs in the, con in the country. So uh, the testing is this uh, is already spread out in on different regions of the Philippines. So I guess um, those labs already help in. Uh, making the testing uh, faster or uh, ha giving the results to the patient faster. And then, um, again, I'm sorry, is there what's the other uh, question? Uh, uh, the questions are, um, uh, oh, uh, what's the reason why uh, cases are, in your opinion, continuing to increase in the Philippines? Uh, the... I think um, it's the more on the lifting of the <laughs> lockdown mm -hmm. for the right. increased cases, and then also um, the uh, the OFWs and the internal migrant workers. So those um, uh, working in the metro also went to the province, right? So I think this right. is the cause of the rise in cases uh, mm -hmm. now in the Philippines. So, okay. yeah. Th thank you. Uh, yes, yes. Dr. Morales, <laughs> you wanted to say something? And actually, um, I could definitely say na nasol na, I guess, yung lack of manpower. Because personally, in our lab, um, DOH has already deployed 20 med techs to do the COVID testing in our lab. And um, I'm pretty sure all other testing labs will have um, medical personnel deployed into their um, um, vicinities as well, as long as you know they ask for these particular um, needs in their testing centers. Likewise, they're also centralizing the stocks. So a lot of these things, the problems that we have encountered in the previous, um, you know, in the first part of the pandemic, they are kind of slowly being addressed and. I think we're go we're um, starting to do better, no? So and then, with regards to the reason, kung bakit hindi natetest lahat ng tao, I guess the only answer to that would be, um, you know, the testing criteria um, um, instituted by um, the OH, no? So right now, the expanding expanded testing guidelines would definitely only be, you know, those with symptoms, those that are ha at high risk, those only that had you know, travel history to the, to, to high risk areas. So definitely there is a disconnect between, you know, um, the, the expanded testing guidelines and what people really are expecting of the expanded testing. So, you know, I think, uh, I guess that's, that's the disconnect. No? So, um, people wanted to, to test, you know, all people, but you know, you so expanded testing guidelines, definitely, not all people are included in the criteria, right? Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Miss uh, Amalia and and uh, Dr. Moralit for answering questions personally on the chat box. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, you know we can go on talking for maybe another hour, but we we are about to wrap up. So I guess I'd like to give each uh, resource person a few minutes, maybe a minute or two, to, to give us their final words. Um, and, and specifically for people or for our guest speakers working in academia, because, you know, USD is an academic institution, you might want to talk about how you see academia and education moving forward in this new normal. Uh, so we, we'd like to ask uh, your final words. Uh, let's start with uh, Ms. Nicola Sora. Uh, final words for our viewers? Um, for the new normal. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so um, I guess um, uh, right now, so we have things that we can't do before. Uh, we can't do as, uh, and we can do. So we we just focus on the things we can do as of the moment. And for um, the 
educate uh, sorry for the education right for the new normal of the education that's what you're asking sir in academia right? in academia yeah, if you want to, to to give your opinion about how academia ah okay so um for the academe uh i think uh it's time that we use our tools now the technology so we we make you use uh we maximize it into good use and um um and for the final word for this um pandemic just want to know that um uh the there are people that working there that are working very hard uh for towards the end of this pandemic and um sometimes uh we don't have the authority to divulge everything so uh we're just doing our work and then uh siguro we just limit on what uh on what we believe on the social media then so parang uh para din makatulong for the uh for for those people na sobrang pagod na <laughs> for from testing or from responding so i think uh so dapat po maging mindful na din tayo and also um uh uh so ano din po um let's uh make uh let's be aware that uh, the respon- the health of the community is the responsibility of each one of us so nandiyan po po yung virus <laughs> so yun lang po <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ms. Nicola Sora. Uh, Dr. Moralit. Okay, so I really like what Ama said. No? Uh, with regards you know, to education, so I'm also a teacher um, right now. So um, what we're going for really in the new normal is, you know, walang face-to-face interaction. And on a different light, I guess, for the old ones, di ba, medyo mahirap siya, di ba? But... When you look at the current generation, you know, we have the TikTok generation. It's kind of exciting, you know, because, you know, the, the platforms that we are doing as a hobby has now become a platform for education, which is, I guess, really good thing now. And I guess that would mean that more people are going to be, at least the younger kids or the younger learners would be at least more at, at, at comfort, you know, during the time of learning. So I guess... Yun yung maganda, and that would be my my final note for this session. So at least also yeah. I would like to say na um, I think the Philippines is really right now. I think there is a you know major counting um, slight negative um, sentiments you know on how we are um, dealing with the pandemic and so on and so forth. But I guess the good the, the silver lining here is that you know we're starting to work slowly towards you know defeating the pandemic and that's a good thing i guess so yeah thank you dr maralit uh dr eggwolf final words yes so in academia and then teaching i would say we basically continue how we ended up last semester So we cannot open our classrooms and also not our labs, unfortunately. So, but hopefully more prepared. So the 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 uh, bad thing about uh, the online teaching about last semester was simply we were not really prepared. So it just happened that from one day to the next day, everything had to be online. And we didn't have any... Uh, lessons prepared for online and everything. We just had to do everything uh, improvised. It was all improvised. So, so we are now undergoing training. So that's good. And hopefully we are all much more prepared now for, for the next semester. So uh, I'm, I'm very, con- con- very convinced that it will become much better. And uh, hopefully uh, we can at some point, I don't know when it will be, maybe end of this year or maybe next year, we can open some of our classrooms. Maybe the labs. The labs is the biggest problem. Our physics labs, how can we teach? How can we teach somebody uh, measuring something without instruments, without having a, a lab available? I guess same as with uh, uh, biology. Huh? So how can you... Uh, do a biological experiment if you don't have lab lab equipment available. 
So I think that the labs, that's the biggest problem. The, I think the, the lectures are okay online, but we have to find a way what to do with the labs. It's an important part of our education, and I'm not so sure yet how this will work. Thank you, Dr. Egwolf. And finally, Father? Uh, I know that most of the people who are watching this webcast are, are students in the College of Science. And I would like to tell them, you know, I just want to remind them that if there's one thing that pan this pandemic has taught the whole world is that scientists are important. Um, the Philippines needs more scientists. And in the new normal, the students who are studying science should understand that they are studying science not just because it is fun, even though it is fun, but because in doing what they are doing, they are serving their country in a way that we don't usually imagine. So we, we, we say soldiers fight for the country. One of the things that the pandemic has shown is that medical techs, doctors, nurses, genome scientists, epidemiologists, biologists, mathematicians, scientists are also fighting for the country in our own way. And I think I need to emphasize that because often young people do not appreciate that uh, because our society often doesn't appreciate it. One of my students here in the United States came to me, uh, well, Zoomed with me a couple of weeks ago. He's a biology major, he's a third year student. And he said, Father, I realize now that being a scientist is as cool as anyone else. And I think that's really important to emphasize, no matter how difficult it will be to learn science in the new normal, and it will be very difficult, as Dr. Eggwolf pointed out, science is a noble profession. It is something that uh, we do, not because God has called us to do it. And we do it for ourselves and for our families, for our loved ones, and for our country as well. I, and I would hope that we would remember that when we learn, when we go back to school in the fall, wherever that, and I am scheduled to be a visiting professor at USD, teaching in the industrial biology department, in the industrial biology. So I'm really excited to teach my first Filipino students in class. Thank you, uh, Father. And thank you to all our resource speakers, Father Ostriaco, Dr. Eggwolf, Dr. Moralit, and Ms. Nicola Sora. Again, we could have talked for another hour, but unfortunately, yeah. uh, we have to end this and we have to thank them. Uh, so we want to acknowledge a few other people. We want to acknowledge the College of Science Student Council, the College of Science Journal, the USD Educational Technology Center, or USD EdTech, and Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Uh, okay, so for yung mga susunod pong events sa ating mails or Modified Enhanced Online Week of Science, so on July 7, yeah, that will be Tuesday. There was going to be, uh, there will be a poster, a science post, a scientific poster exhibit. Then next one would be a series of webinars. So again, makikita niyo po uli ako bukas. And that will be on, I mean, the topic would be on living on the impacts of environmental pollution in the Philippines, care of the uh, biology department. Tapos sa afternoon naman po would be from the chemistry department naman. And that's harnessing the Samashan spirit to rise above this pandemic. Then on Wednesday, there will be a tribute video for our retirees. Then next one would be again Wednesday, July 8th, webinar series, care of the psychology department. So, and sa afternoon naman po would be from the math and physics department. Then on Thursday, there will be a tribute to, uh, I mean, vid tribute video to our graduates this batch 2020. Then on Thursday again, 
July 9, Araw Parangal or Pusa, Parangal ng USC Science Awards. Then on Friday naman po would be Student Teacher Testimonial Mass and that would be yun po, July 10, Friday at 10 o'clock a.m. So, yeah. Then last would be yung ating modified, uh, I mean, yung um, variety show and that would be the Modified Enhanced Online Week of Science Concert 2020. Yeah. So it will be live again po sa ating Facebook and sa YouTube account and CSSC Facebook page. Yeah. Thank you po. So to end this uh, webinar, so let's close our webinar with our concluding prayer. So in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. We thank you, Lord our God, that again on this occasion you have opened our eyes to the light of your wisdom you have gladdened our hearts with knowledge of truth we entreat you lord help us always to do your will bless us and enable us to grow in grace virtue and good habits that your name may be glorified in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen so thank you everyone and thank you everyone good afternoon po. good afternoon Bye. Thank you po sa ating mga speakers. Thank you to our speakers. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, speakers and moderators. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, uh, Father. Thank you, uh, Ama, Vivek, uh, Mike. Then, then. Yeah. Thank you, Dee.